Craig Smith, his third year in Salt Lake City, and he's trying to get the Utes program turned back around. It's kind of amazing that Utah hasn't played in the NCAA tournament since 2016. Utah will have the ball first, playing on the road, their first true road game of the year tonight at the historic venue in Moraga, California, which has typically been a very tough place to play. But as Sean referenced, Weber State came in early this year and beat the Gales. Nice play defensively early by Josh Jefferson defending Brandon Carlson, the guy that Sean was just talking about. There's the starting five for St. Mary's. Yeah, this is an experienced group. Uh, Josh Jefferson moves in there replacing Kyle Bowen, but everybody else had played pivotal minutes last year, really throughout the course of the year. And Alex Dukas is another guy, number 44 in white. He's, he's dealt with a back injury that took him out of the game against UConn, a game in which St. Mary's was in the lead. He dealt with some back issues while in Las Vegas as well, and, and that's something that you have to have concern about if you're a Gales fan because they need his production. He can stretch it from the outside. He's got a toughness and a grit to them. Mitchell Saxon has his shot blocked, but a whistle and a foul call. And that's going to be a foul against Utah and mean free throws for Mitchell Saxon. The second big man. I mean, Utah, if you wait the minutes played, Utah is the biggest team in the country by average height. But St. Mary's has some size themselves. Mitchell Saxon, 6'10 senior. Comes up a little bit short on that one. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, that's kind of a theme of the early season for the Gales. Not just shooting poorly from the outside. Even the free throw line's been a struggle. And there was a time in Las Vegas, Aiden Mahaney went to the line for a technical foul. He missed it. Then they shot two free throws after it, and they missed both. I mean, it's, it, it's uncharacteristic things that have kind of derailed things early this season for St. Mary's, but it's not things that you have to be long-term concerned about, I, I would say, at this point in time, because we've seen this before in the past as well. Open three look. You saw the starting five for the Utes. That's Colt Bajima. Transfer from the University of Washington. His first year at Utah. Missed the three. So Gale's ball. Love to play at a deliberate pace. Nice defensive play. And the shot was blocked. Raleigh Wooster is a very good defensive player. Carlson inside, matched up against Jefferson, and he scores. Yeah, I think that's a matchup you got to get to early in this game and continue to play through. Uh, Carlson can stretch it, obviously, from the outside, but his size advantage over Josh Jefferson, I, I think you got to go to that and, and establish him with that deep post position. Probably makes his head coach happy. He told us when we talked to Craig Smith before the game, Saxon just kind of a wild miss. And Brandon Carlson's such a good outside shooter as a big man. But Craig Smith said he can't forget that he is allowed to go in the paint and score there. Nice drive and the bucket for the Utes. Really good start for Utah. I, I think with a little bit of confidence coming back after that Davidson game, if you can get out in front early here, it, it starts to really apply pressure to St. Mary's because they don't lose at home normally. Obviously, they just took the loss against Weaver State. But this is a team that plays very well in that building and feeds off the energy of the crowd. But they're not built to come from behind. Carlson contested shot, Ooh. and that one's good. So he's got two early buckets, and Utah's got a 6-1 lead. Nice really move. good start. Yeah, it's a great it's a great move and it's the versatility. He can he can pick and pop He can have the mid-range game. He can play with his back to the basket Good drive that time by Augustus Marshallonis Dave and, and uh, Marshallonis is the guy that we've taken a look back at Carlson though down low on the block Feel where the defense is and, and just utilize your size Jefferson is 6 8 you're seven feet tall you're gonna be able to Get that out of the top because Jefferson's not really a shot blocker at any at any point whether it's in transition or not He just doesn't have the athleticism and the length to block that shot Marshall Otis Rattles on the first free throw coming off a career high 17 points for him And then as Sean referenced he hadn't been totally healthy he hadn't played particularly well In the early season so a confidence booster in the Gales win just a few days ago I watched him play in that Hawaii scrimmage that they had and I was like wow He has he has taken that step forward as we've seen so many guards under Randy Bennett be able to do and then he, he really doesn't look that way since up until that Davidson game So from a Gales perspective if you can get Marshall Lonas consistently attacking drawing fouls getting the free throw line distributing the ball Those are all positives for their offense
They avoided committing the foul there, so played pretty good defense. Wooster missed the shot. St. Mary's down 6-3, but with the ball back. Marshall is up and under, no good. Saxon tip, also no good. Saxon, another offensive rebound. Duke is three. That one's good. The best time to find that three-point shooter is after that offensive rebound. Quick kick out. Usually it's a long closeout, which means it's a free look. St. Mary's a very good and determined offensive rebounding team. Well, good news for Utah to see Kaba Keda in the game. He missed the last two. Saxon pokes the ball away from him out of bounds. Utes, Sean, have not had much depth in the early season. No, watch this though. The Mitchell Saxon doing what he does, just, just volleyball it around, and then Alex Duke is really smart. Moves and relocates, which changed the angle for his defensive player to close out, gave him that space. Tend to shoot for Utah. There's Carlson still matched up against Jefferson. Marshall Owens trying to help out. Wooster went right by him. Saxon couldn't block the shot. And with the left hand, Wooster finished. That was a great aggressive attack. Dave, Utah's made four out of the last five field goals they've taken. They've also choked off Aiden Mahaney on this end of the floor. Mahaney has the ball here. Had a hard time getting a shot off. There's one, and he scores. And last year, remember, he was a big-time second-half player. He'd score a bunch of points in the second half. He had the ability to take over games. We saw that as you and I were there for the game against Gonzaga in that building. But they need him to be start fast and stay fast all the way through the game. And, and that is the evolution of a player that has the talent that he has. That's a Utah turnover, 15-32 still to go first half, and a good one. Well, their inability to score applied so much pressure to the defensive end. And when you saw the confidence get rattled and you saw their opponents, and by the way, San Diego State, a really good defensive team, start to really kind of pressure out more, and the pressure was disruptive to what the Gales wanted to do. They don't have a player this year like a Logan Johnson that could athletically beat you off the bounce and finish at the rim uh, or above the rim and, and be that energy giver. And so now it's a collective group, Dave, and so it's a little bit different vibe, at least early on this season. And ultimately, they're going to have to make shots like that last one. Jefferson was wide open for a three and just missed it. Here's Brandon Carlson down low. Saxon now matched up against him. Didn't matter. Another tough shot goes down. How about the field, the ability to create space and elevate up over the top? And you can see why he's one of the very best big men scorers in all of college basketball. Marshall Otis, three, good. That's a great sign for St. Mary's. Number three needs to get going, and he doesn't have to do it all. Uh, but double-digit score every single night, be counted upon to run the offense, not turn the ball over, facilitate. Those are the keys for Augustus Marshall Otis. Yeah, take some of that burden away from Aiden Mahaney. He's a different kind of player than Logan Johnson. That was supposed to be a pass, I believe, and it hit the rim. It was not a good pass, Dave. <laughs> I was just trying to decide, pass or shot. I went with pass. I went with pass as well. So did the official right. score, by the way. Okay, good to know. Turns into a turnover. Marshall Otis, another three. That one no good. Saxon, great position, and then had the ball stripped away. That was a good play underneath the basket, and then a bad pass. And St. Mary's gets the breakaway dunk for Mahaney. The one thing you could not do against St. Mary's is turn it over because they are opportunistic. Now, they're trying to run a little bit more than they have in the past, but they're going to be opportunistic off that off turnovers and look to get easy buckets and then they get back and they do force you to have to run your offense their defensive transition is really solid Wooster trying to drive in against Marshall Onis in the lane for a good long while tough shot Madsen air ball Marshall Onis got cut off and then he threw it away Here's Wooster's three. That one no good. Already bent it out in the middle of the floor, putting both his hands down, telling his team they want to slow it down. This is a team very comfortable with scoring in the final third of the shot clock. That's how they like to play. Jefferson, another good look for three. And again, he misses. 
They're going to call a foul against Dukas. Let's go back to that last transition bucket, though. The turnover, Dukas jumps the passing lane, throws it ahead to Mahaney, and finishes. And, and the easy buckets, there's a couple things that happen when that happens. He builds confidence, right? Like Mahaney gets to get a little bit of a rhythm. Dukas, by getting the steal, gets everybody up off the bench. It creates energy. All those things are giving to the culture and the identity of what St. Mary's wants to do. Now, this is Marcellonis returned the favor on the last possession. The Utes aren't able to capitalize on it. But, I, I, look, this is a one-possession game, Dave, and I'll be really honest with you. I think it's going to be a tight game all the way throughout. I, that's why I was looking forward. When this got put on our schedule, I was really looking forward to this matchup because of the way these two coaches lead their teams. Me too. And this has a chance on both sides to be a very high quality win. Tough shot, contested shot for Hunter Erickson. And Mason Forbes just in off the bench for St. Mary's. The grad transfer from Harvard got the rebound. Marcellonis fouled. So one thing you don't want to do, listen, St. Mary's doesn't get to the line a whole heck of a lot. They're averaging just under 17 free throws per game. Uh, they, they've not been ultra efficient there, but when the right guy gets the line, they're able to fish. And they call that a passing foul, so not a shooting foul. Luke Barrett, who's playing some bigger minutes this year, number 33, he's in for the Gales. Now Mahaney. Down low to Saxon, shot clock down to five. Saxon with the left hand scores. But not a lot of lift in Mitchell Saxon's game, but it's about positioning and creating an angle. And the second big man, Lawson Lovering, who really is the starting five center, back in on the floor for Utah. But he's got two personal fouls, so that may impact how he defends Saxon down low. Here's Lovering on the offensive end. Oh, hook shot good That size is tough to deal with with Utah, right? I mean they, they've got they got height on top of height on this team and for st. Mary's the concern has got to be utilizing that in the post. We see Carlson off the block in the post Now they're going to Lovery I mean Utah not only do they have two seven-footers they start two seven-footers. It's a big team sir and he's been in the program for a good long while tonight is what is 115th game in his career in a Utah uniform He's played a lot of hoops for the Utes. A special player Same. that has enjoyed the college experience. Uh, I talked to him at the Pac-12 media day and he's absolutely loved his time in Salt Lake. Yeah, I think it's a good point because he did test the waters so to speak and he thought about going to the NBA after last year. Shot clock winding down Saxon kicks it and the jumper is good. Aiden Mahaney, they left him open and he knocked it down. What a defensive breakdown. You cannot help off of Aiden Mahaney, in particular on ball side. Drive and dump down. They're going to call a foul against St. Mary's. Dave, watch the defense just pinch towards Mitchell Saxon. Uh, you know what? Mitchell Saxon one-on-one -on -one with a seven-footer guarding him. I'll take the seven-footer in a one-on-one -on -one matchup. I'm not leaving Aiden Mahaney wide open from three. Yeah, you, you just know that that was emphasized for Utah in their scouting report. Just a breakdown. Wooster three for the answer. Good. How about that execution on the out of bounds underneath? Come off the high ball screen. Just a quick kick. Well, offense you get from Raleigh Wooster is a bonus because he's really a, a distributor, a really good defensive player, not known for his scoring. A toughness uh, personified against in that Houston matchup, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But watch feet set, catch and shoot. Beautiful release, actually, on that one. Just a 17% three point shooter on the season, Dave. You wouldn't know it watching that form. Here's a catch and shoot three, left side for Luke Barrett, no good. And Utah may have a chance to run. Gales got back. You got a mismatch down low, though. That's Lovering against Forbes, and Forbes blocks his shot. Now that's pretty impressive, Mason Forbes. I mean, he is six nine, but he's not seven one like Lawson Lovering. Yeah, just great timing. Didn't let him get that ball all the way up to the apex of his release, and instead got it on the way up. Mason Forbes, great timing there, and. and, and 
he's another player that could start to add a little bit of a different dimension to this St. Mary's team in Mason Ford. Booster air ball that time, and it goes off of the Utes. That was a little more like the 17%. <laughs> Dave, I'm a half full guy, you're a half empty guy. Not at all. Not I Raleigh Wooster is a very good player. I think any coach would want him on their team. Yeah, he's had a couple of near triple doubles. Yeah, hasn't been a great shooter. That's it. That's all. <laughs> Mahaney had it poked away briefly. This is the first basketball game of your season, you know. Uh, it's true. You've been dealing with a lot of football games. You had to watch my Bruins play the Cal Bears the other night, so I can get why you're a little cranky tonight. It's okay. Yeah. Touchdown, St. Mary's. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> that was a pretty good shot from Aiden Mahaney. He's gotten really good on those drives and floaters over the top. And Ben Carlson hits the three off the bench for Utah. So shots going down now on both sides. Ben Carlson has been an excellent shooter. Ball knocked out of bounds. Gales will keep it. Dave, go watch this. The nice floater by Aiden Mahaney up over the length of the defense. You know there's a lot of size, so you know you got to practice those one-legged floaters in the middle of the paint. And then Carlson at the other end of the floor. The versatility of the bigs at Utah. Again, they force the five man of your of the opposing team away from the basket. I think it's actually really key to space the floor with the fives tonight for Utah because Mitchell Saxon is a good rebounder and if you can take him away from the hoop it might create some lanes for you to get some offensive rebounds and putbacks against the Gales. Out of bounds off of Dukas. That's a St. Mary's turnover. I think it's a good point. Mitchell Saxon now takes a seat. Harry Wessels who's a big guy down low. A little less experience. A sophomore off the bench for St. Mary's. Eight and a half to go, first half. Gales with a two-point lead, a little crossover move. Three, it's good. Impressive. You start, start shooting the shot from the outside with that kind of confidence on the road. They're now three of six from beyond the arc on the game. And that'll wear out this defense a little bit for the Gales. He's spreading it out a little bit. Mahaney crossover. His three goes. <laughs> Oh, see, that's why you can't help off of them on the one that they gave him, Dave, because now we've seen the ball go through the hoop. Now you've got that rhythm, that bounce back to Aiden Mahaney, and when he gets going, he can be one of the best scorers in the country. He's got 12 already and is a perfect 5-for-5 five five from the field. You mentioned it. You and I were there last year in Moraga. Gonzaga St. Mary's, one of the games of the year in college hoops, and I do believe that his stretch at the end of that game was the best that any player played in college basketball. Now Gabe Madsen hits a three. They're going down from everywhere. Dave, I don't care where they're going down. I just love when shots are being made. There's been a lot of games I've called earlier this season. A couple of them with the Gales. Well, there have been some struggle to find shots that fall through the hoop. But this has been a lot of fun to watch because these two teams are playing fast, they're playing with purpose, and they're playing aggressively. A good hustle by Mason Forbes, but the big man Brandon Carlson stayed with it and just swatted his shot away. And now on this end, no good. Ben Carlson offensive rebound after Brandon Carlson missed the three. He's going to go that fadeaway again. Let's see if he does. He did. And he came up short this time, but nobody for St. Mary's grabbed the ball. Now an open look for three is good. You can tell when they isolate him on space with a smaller player, that's usually when he's going to feel where the defense is and kind of rotate off of it. Uh, lucky that nobody picked it up for the Gales, and, and then Utah made him play, pay with the three-pointer. Bad pass from Marshall Onis. Yeah, the shots are going down. Badgerman made that last three. No whistle. Duke has hit the floor, but no foul. Here's Madsen's three, and that one's good. Utah making shots from everywhere, and it's 30 to 23. Timeout, St. Mary. Before the start of the year, I'll tell you, if you have not seen Wolga Poplar play, 
Like, he, he's filled in that role, role that Isaiah Wong left, and he's been sensational. Shooting the ball from the outside, one of the elite-level athletes. Jim Laranega's squad is legit. Backing up what they did at the end of the year last year, Josh Jefferson out of the timeout, a much-needed basket for St. Mary's. Gales had an early lead, but Utah's just been chucking in threes. That ends a 9-0 run. Utah's last six made baskets all from three-point range. Madsen got cut off the inside. Yeah, Madsen flips it off the glass. All right, they can make it two also. But Dave, I mean, the thing about it, though, is they're shooting 59% from the field. St. Mary's has hung its hat on playing tough defense and holding opponents to 38% shooting. Right now, their inability to get stops is the reason why they're not winning this game. And it's not just the three-point shot. It's the quality of the look in which the Utes are executing against Randy Bennett's team. Yeah, maybe dole out the credit in both ways. St. Mary's defense needs to be better. Utah's offensive execution has been excellent. They called a tie-up on that offensive rebound attempt. Frank Smith has please. it. Man, he might have had an open shot. Stepped into a tough shot and it goes. And he's been the lone bright spot right now for the Gales. He has 14 of their 27 points and he is 6 of 6 shooting. The rest of the team is 4 of 18. Hmm. Lucas knocks the ball out of bounds. Uh, Aiden Mahaney doing everything he can right now to keep the Gales in this game. The off-balance finish in the paint. We saw the step-back three a little bit earlier on off the bounce. Uh, he, he has a good base. He's added strength to his lower body in particular to be able to make moves like that. But I think where that strength needs to continue to develop is at this end of the floor. Defensively, can he become a menace? Uh, can he compete? The same way he competes for a shot on the defensive end. I think that's what will take his game to the next level. Spin move and then a whistle on a foul. Lovering, the seven footer, is going to go to the free throw line. This will be the first free throws of the game for the Utes. Good job getting position, attacking again. You got seven footers with versatility that can catch the ball off the block and apply pressure to the defense. Biggest team in college basketball. No free throws, raining down threes. No good. I was going to leave that one there for you to, you to commentate on. I thought it was your place there. I, I went minimal. <laughs> Second one for Lovering, and that one is good. Same guy. Now, you look at the free throw numbers of the year, 80% free throw shooter. First one, an aberration from how he shot it all season long so far. Yeah, who knows what happened. Muscle spasm. And he got to that elbow area. Then nice feed to Mitchell Saxon. Uses a shot fake, and he missed a layup. It goes out of bounds off of Utah. Mitchell Saxon from point-blank range. And now just one of four shooting, and you can't ask a guard to get you a better look than the one that Aiden Mahaney just gave Mitchell Saxon. Twenty on the shot clock. Gale's got fortunate to get the ball back. Mahaney dishes. Jefferson dunks it all. Nice job by Aiden Mahaney. The attention of the defense clearly going to start shifting to number 20 with how well he's played so far here in the first half. Last possession, twice he set up the interior players of St. Mary's. Down low. Oh, Good look from Brandon Carlson. And, and, and Mahaney got caught watching the ball. And, and a great back cut and an easy finish. That might be a little example of what you were talking about. Still room to improve. Man, he's such a skilled offensive player. Alex Dukas drives to the bucket, and he uses the glass to score. Hesitation move down the lane. Wooster, no good. Rebound. Snatched away by Chris Howell. Saxon against Carlson. 
Carlson, good defense. Saxon had to give it up. And he just walled up, made life difficult for him. But then Saxon went out, set a screen. Dukas is going to be given a flop warning. He made the three. But I, I'm sure for the Gale, uh, there's some things that haven't gone so well in this first half. They're, they're down a point. After the flop call, the free throws for Utah, the free throw. Cole Badgema is arguing for a second one, but he's only going to get the one. Well, this has been fun. I mean, offensively, both teams have started to find a little bit of a flow here in the latter stages of this first half. St. Mary's has made their last three shots. Utah's made four out of their last five shots that they've attempted. Good play by Josh Jefferson. Almost stole it away. Thought that it went off of Utah. Instead, Utes keep the ball. And Josh Jefferson, I mean, he's a, you, you said it early on. He's an important guy for the Gales, and he's starting to play better tonight. Well, David, as much as we talk about the Gales and, and their three-game losing streak that they broke against Davidson, let's not look past the fact that this is a Utah team that has lost its last two games, including the last one out against St. John's. Yeah, well, one of those losses. Mahaney got open, missed a three this time, so that's his first miss. And Utah on the move. They lost, Utah did to Houston. Now Houston's one of the best teams in the country. I described going against Houston's defense as getting, going to the dentist volunteering to have three of your teeth removed and then begging them not to give you any Novocaine. <laughs> That's what it's like to play against the defense of Kelvin Sampson. Jefferson long two is good. Either that or I watched Little Shop of Horrors yesterday. I'm not quite sure. But either way, let's go. I, I'm, I'm going with it. Houston's got another good team this year built on those same principles, but it's a good point you make. Utah, they need a win. Brandon Carlson fumbled the pass, got it back. Now makes his move, and Jefferson hit it off of the leg of Carlson out of bounds. Carlson wanted the foul there. This would be a good angle to see if there was one. It probably was a couple of times there. A couple of slaps on the, on the right arm. Fun first half. Tie game under a minute and a half to go until halftime. Mahaney three. Too strong. Rebound Utah. I like the fact, though, that he's hunting for a shot. He missed one shot. He didn't hesitate the second time. Down the lane. Right. Wooster. Yeah, he puts Utah back ahead. But, Dave, that's what I'm talking about at the defensive end for Mahaney. I mean, that's just a little bit too, too easy that time. And if you're Utah, we've seen this before, too, last year. Teams would start to figure out who Aiden Mahaney was guarding and then look to try to utilize him to attack. Saxon under the basket. Saxon finds Mahaney. Down the lane to Jefferson with a foul. A great finish by Jefferson. A beautiful pass by Aiden Mahaney. Get a piece of the paint and just a small window, a little dump down. Reading where the defense was giving him. And Jefferson did a great job working that baseline, corralling that and able to finish. A very good high school product out of Las Vegas, Nevada. And it's really started to come on as the year went on. Kyle Bowen struggled to shoot late in the season last year. And Joshua Jefferson stepped in a couple of times and made big shots in big moments for the Gales. Did not seem to be afraid of the big stage. Misses that free throw, though, so no three-point play. Game tied. There is a difference. Shot clock, game clock, right around 12 seconds. Catch and shoot three, no good. Ben Carlson missed it, and now St. Mary's can hold for the final shot of the first half. Randy Bennett wants a timeout. So the Gales are going to try to draw up a play. The Lakers tonight, 138-94. That works. Out of the timeout, Mahaney gives it up. Marshall three, in and out. Rebound Utah. 
And the final seconds tick off the clock. That heave is no good. And it seems fitting, Sean. We go to halftime with the score tied. You and I felt that the success, and then they didn't come back to him in the latter stages of the first half. So I would think that early here, Coach Smith is going to get Brandon Carlson involved. Well, let's see. Very first possession of the second half. Utah's got the ball. Important game on both sides. St. Mary's snapped a losing streak. Utah's dropped two in a row. Little elbow jumper for the seven-footer Lawson Lovering came up way short. I like the movie Major League. I don't think that one's got the distance. <laughs> Too high. Too high. Yeah. <laughs> uh, on the free throw, I should have used the Euchre line. Just a bit outside. <laughs> That ball off of Abe Mahaney. That's a St. Mary's turnover and good defense by Bajima and the Utes. Well, he did. Good went off his fingertips. Yeah, good call by Mike Reed standing right in front of it. Mike Reed was an alternate last year at the Final Four. Well, that's a great honor to be part of the officiating crew in any capacity at the Final Four. He's one of the best officials in the country for this non-conference matchup tonight. Raleigh Wooster from the elbow. All right, that one was just a bit outside. Tried the corner and made it. <laughs> Problem is, you want to hit the rim. Yeah. Not a good look on the first two possessions for Utah. No. Carlson bumped Jefferson. Josh Jefferson had a good first half for the Gales. Uh, outside of Aiden Mahaney, I think he was the other bright spot. Uh, eight points, four rebounds. Good activity at the offensive. Look, it, you, you cannot stand still. You're easy to guard if you're standing still. And Josh Jefferson did a good job of moving to open space. Saxon having a hard time in this game tonight. Getting going offensively. One dribble, spin move, left hand, no. That's because he's being guarded by someone that's as tall, if not taller than him. Yeah, credit both Lovering and Carlson. Lovering's got it on the low block. Making his move. He might have delivered an elbow right to the midsection of Mitchell Saxon, and he scored. A good, strong move, though. Two feet in the paint. Didn't really hesitate at all there. So there's your first bucket of the second half on either side. Shalonis, three. That one no good. Saxon fought for the offensive board. It goes off of Dukas out of bounds. So Utah will get it back. Last possession, great post up. Watch the move. Look to see, is there any help coming? Nope, we're one-on-one. -on -one. Let's go. And then just extending out that elbow and hooking a little bit with that elbow and allowing him to finish with his left hand. Utah with a two-point lead. Bajima cut off in the lane. Now Lovering was wide open. Saxon recovered and blocked the shot. Duke is in transition. Behind the back with the pass. Now Jefferson squares up. He misses. St. Mary's still without a basket since halftime. Three. Too strong. Oh, the good offense, the flow, the shots going down in the first half. Been missing in these last three minutes. I'd like to go back to how it was in the first half, Dave. I, I prefer that personally, just as a viewer, a fan. Here's Saxon. Saxon really having a hard time. They call a foul. Uh, Dave, Utah would, would trying you to defend be the big man. With you and I being home, I kind of feel like this is our version of the Manning cast, you know, because Monday Night Football is going on. Like, it's like you and I kind of talking hoop, watching a really good game. Who, who's Peyton? Who's Eli? I'm probably more Eli. I think you're more Peyton. Duke is no good for three. <laughs> Who are we going to get? Is, is, is uh, Keith Van Horn available as a special <laughs> guest? <laughs> How about Andre Miller? I'll take an Andre Miller oh. and, and a... And a Matthew Delavadova. Now that would be a good that would be a good uh, Fleming Farnham cast. Yes. Right. Now you're coming up with ideas. That one off of Utah. Get a little flatbread action from Spokane flown down in. 
I, I can, you know, it's only November. I can tell you're already looking forward to your first flatbread. December 28th. Maybe like a holiday time? I was thinking, yeah. <laughs> December 28th, straight off the plane. <laughs> yeah, if you're in Spokane around the holidays, just meet Sean there. Jefferson three. That one no good. And St. Mary's had good looks and they can't buy a basket. See if Utah can make them pay though. I mean, it's key when St. Mary's isn't making shots. You got to create separation. Utah has not been able to do that. They haven't. It's only a four point difference, even though St. Mary's has not scored in the second half. From the corner, Duke is three is good, and now the lead is just one. And that was a nice drive kick to the corner for Alex Dukas and him finding his shot again is huge for St. Mary's. Yeah, he looks more like his old self. Mahaney's having a good game, but Utah with a one-point lead on the road against a good team. Now a kick ball. Chris Howell trying to defend the entry pass. And that will send us to our first part of a great challenge with a lot of teams that have had success this season already. I think both conferences well represented to the top 25. Both these teams here tonight, Utah and St. Mary's, feel like they can be that caliber of team this year. That three, no good. Rebound Ooh, tipped up rebound. in. Kaba Kata, who's coming back from missing a couple of games. That's his first bucket of the night. I haven't seen a lot of offensive rebounds for Utah as St. Mary's does such a great job rebounding the defensive end of the floor, but a good job getting inside position was key. Off the offensive rebound, Mahaney, no good. They're calling an offensive foul, and they're calling Mitchell Saxon for pushing the defender out of the way. An empty possession for the Gales, and Utah has a chance again to extend out their lead. And remember, with the way the Gales and, and their struggles, by the way, a lot of their struggles have come in the second half, Dave. They have not shot the ball as well in the second half. They've been outscored in the second half by 37 points so far this season. Uh, weird. I mean, do you have any explanation for that? Well, see, when the shots don't go down, Dave, that counts as a miss shot, and the points don't go on the board, so. <laughs> Jumper no good. Kata gets another offensive rebound. His second in a row. Oh, how about that? From Gabe Manson. Boy, he's had a great game. 14 now. Six of nine shooting from the floor for Madsen. Just Here's the reason why, Dave, to, to go back to your point, though, Dave, they don't get a lot of production off the bench to the guests. And so a lot of their scoring has to come from their starters, and their starters are playing a ton of minutes early in the season. And when you get out of rhythm, you can start to struggle. Wow, Mahaney just airballed a three. But how about this offensive rebound? Second offensive rebound in a row against the Gales, and then just movement without the ball, and Dukas got beat on the back door. You get Matson able to finish. What a game he's had. Yeah, beautiful. And Utah's got themselves a five-point lead here. Matson curled off the screen, almost slipped. Now pulls up and misses that one. Kane got his hand on another loose ball. That's three in a row. Here's a fallaway three, way too strong. Jefferson rebound. St. Mary's offense, though, only one shot made here in the second half under the basket, and Forbes threw it off the back of the backboard. Now, oh, St. Mary's offense has just disappeared, and now a foul against the Gales. Kata making an impact on the game on the offensive glass. Three of his rebounds, uh, three of his four rebounds, but have been an offensive end. And yeah, all of those three offensive rebounds have come in the last couple of possessions. They have. Good hustle sequence there for K. Bakeda. 6'8 sophomore who goes back to the bench. That's how you make an impact on the game coming in and playing in a short burst. Erickson just gave it away. That's a Utah turnover. Out on the break. St. Mary's pinned up against the backboard. Chris Howell just kind of flung it up there. And Brandon Carlson hustled back and grabbed it. Now down low, the move by Lovering with a foul. 
And they talk about a sequence that is just heartbreaking for the Gales. I mean, first of all, you get a turnover, you think you got a run out. I'm not even sure we can call this a block as much as we can a snatch. I mean, he just went up there, pinned it, grabbed it, and then they went. And Lovering does a great job at the opposite end, pinning and sealing. He's got the smaller player behind his back, knows exactly where he's at, feels it, and spins off of him for an end one opportunity. Now let's see if we see that 80% free throw shooter this time. Lawson Lovering. No good. Rebound. And it goes to St. Mary's, but a Gales foul. More good hustle. Utah's just outworking St. Mary's in the second half. They are. Uh, they, they are right now attacking their offensive glass, gaining extra possessions. Really impressed with Craig Smith's team and how they responded out of the break. A tie contest. Yeah, I mean, Dave, they, they, to me, they, if you want to be an NCAA tournament team and you're Utah, you got to win this game on the road. This would count for Utah as a quad one win. I mean, it, it, this is like the equivalent. Erickson three, no good. Manson just snaps the rebound away. Then he had his shot blocked. And we get a whistle. Who's that on? Maybe against Utah. Randy Bennett is trying to figure out what's going on. We got a flop on Erickson. Huh. This could be a flop on Erickson, which again means a technical. Uh, and, and a free throw at the other end of the floor. It's not a technical, but it's flopping call and then going to the opposite end of the floor for a free throw. I don't think that was a flop, though. I, I think he just lost his balance. He's, he stepped on Aiden Mahaney's foot and, and he kind of lost his balance and fell out. Usually you see the flop. Like, most guys don't throw themselves and propel themselves into a bench if it's a flop, unless you're watching Monday Night Raw. Um, in the WWF uh, so or WWE so that one is I think more legitimate and should not have been called if that was a flop that's the greatest acting job in the history of college hoops I just Saxon checked he's not a theater manager <laughs> <laughs> down the lane and ball stripped away they're going to call a Utah foul though Luke Barrett drove down the lane I think that one's against Brandon Carlson. St. Mary's, Sean, in this half, one for 11 from the field. Mitchell Saxon for the game is having a hard time even getting shots off. He's one for five. Credit this Utah defense. And look at the way they wall up on the inside. I mean, they just are not giving up any space. That's going to be all travel. On a travel. That's a, I think they just call it a travel. They probably could have called it as a push off. The positioning defensively for Utah has been great. They wall up at the defensive end of the floor, and then you dip the shoulder down, and then, yep, move both feet. You could have gone either way on that one, in my opinion. And went for the steal. Carlson put it on the floor. It goes off of, I think, Luke Barrett's foot or leg out of bounds. Utah keeps it. Still a long way to go in this one, 12 14, but Utah really has controlled this second half. They've come out not, not, not shooting great, but they're rebounding really well, and that rebounding number is what's given them a good opportunity here. Jefferson played good defense that time on Brandon Carlson. Been quiet since the early minutes. Erickson down low scores. David, Utah has seven more shot attempts, or six more shot attempts rather, here in this this half than St. Mary's does. Yeah, that speaks to that rebounding that you're talking about. Mahaney tried to thread a pass through to Saxon. It went off of Utah. So the Gales will happen to me. He's very emblematic of this Utah team for his position. He's got size He's got experience the Utah's a big strong tough experienced team And they have high expectations. They should St. Mary's ball needing offense badly Gales just are 
Struggling so much here since halftime on the offensive end. Duke is down low. Layup good for Mason Forbes. A good job that time by Forbes. Back cutting behind Carlson who had switched off on, Ma uh, on Saxon and did not recover in time to identify where he was. Wooster, they left him open, so he takes a three, misses the three. Rebound, Gales. There's Saxon again. That matchup against Lawson Lovering has done an excellent job defensively. Saxon couldn't get a shot off, and he couldn't get the pass accurately to Mahaney. Otherwise, Mahaney would have had an open three. Instead, tough two. Offensive rebound, put back, no, and a foul is going to be called against Utah. That's going to send, I believe, Forbes to the line. Good job by Forbes to get on the offensive glass. We talked a little bit about Utah having success there early in the second half. But Dave, even within this, like that possession there, like St. Mary's scores here. But the, the, the flow of their offense has been disrupted by Utah's defense and the length that Utah has out on the floor. When your arms are up as a defensive player with the length that Utah has, it shrinks the windows and passing lanes. And I think it just causes hesitation. And when you hesitate at the offensive end, there, your timing gets thrown off ever so slightly, and it makes things more difficult. It's kind of amazing it's only a four-point game. Matson had it knocked away, but Kata... Right back in the game, finds Madsen after coming up with a loose ball. Wooster on Dukas. Wooster underneath the bucket. Saxon gets the block. Shot clock down to two. That one is an air ball. Good defense, that possession by the Gales. Everywhere that Wooster went, somebody was there with him, protecting the rim, making sure they stood behind, stood the way, and did not allow him to get a seam. Alex Duke is walling up beautifully at the defensive side, allowing Mitchell Saxon to deflect that shot, and then a good contest leads to the air ball. Mahaney's had a very quiet second half. Aid Mahaney. Matched up with the big man, Brandon Carlson, on the perimeter. Forbes inside draws another foul. Wooster got his hand in there. And I think St. Mary's has got to continue to be aggressive, Dave, because with their offense struggling, just 2 of 14 from the field here to start the second half. Getting to the free throw line, drawing fouls, will be a way to manufacture the game, tighten things up, stop the clock, allow you to set up your defense. Almost to St. Mary's turnover. Cato was arguing that he knocked it off of Saxon. Instead, St. Mary's keeps it 18 to shoot, down four with the ball. Mahaney, pull-up jumper, good. And they love to get that little handoff action after the inbound and allow him to try to get just a step. And if he gets a step, he's going up with it. So a little 6 nothing run here for the Gales. Lead down to two. Kind of a wild heave by Pajamo, but he draws a foul. Aiden Mahaney, watch the inbound. They're going to they're gonna throw it in, and it's immediately a handoff action. Erickson trails, and that forces you to make decisions in the help side and the back line, and, and everybody, the lack of communication there, nobody committed to getting to Aiden Mahaney. Free throw rattles home. Tuesday, ACC-SEC Men's Challenge begins. 7.30 Eastern on ESPN, Miami and Kentucky, and then Clemson. And Alabama, 9.30 Eastern, both games on ESPN on Tuesday. Alabama lost a game earlier last week for Feast Week. They lost to Ohio State and came back and beat the Oregon Ducks. And that Kentucky team, I think they threw 118 up last time they took the floor. Kind of looks like a different Kentucky team this year, doesn't it? 
Yeah, they're shooting the three-point shot a lot more consistent than what they did last year as far as volume goes. Now, they were a good three-point shooting team last year, Kentucky was, but they, they did not attempt a lot of three-pointers. This year, they freed things up a little bit. They got a young group, kind of back to some of those earlier Kentucky teams where you're relying upon freshmen, and so you kind of got to let them play through some mistakes. I think John Calipari has done a great job so far. Speaking of feast week, what a week for Purdue. Yeah, you think? I mean, that, you win the Maui Invitational. I don't care who was winning that tournament. If Shamanad won that tournament, I'd been like, wow, what a great week. You know, I mean, it just, it, <laughs> it was just an unbelievable field with so many big time teams uh, that, that have aspirations of making a run all the way to the Final Four this year. I think Marquette, I left that week, by the way, really impressed with Marquette. You know, still have question marks about Tennessee. Dave, this is a Tennessee Volunteers team that really defends really well. And we know that. But there are times late in the game where offensively things just get bogged down for them. And they struggle to score in those big moments. And until that changes, you know, the, the, the defense is good enough to win the national championship. They're clearly an NCAA tournament team that's going to be a high seed and have a chance. But that offense has got to continue to come around. Now the free throw for Utah. Now their lead is back to five impressions with Gonzaga and their performance last week. Uh, you know, I, I thought overall this is a team that's still kind of trying to find their way. They suffered an injury early. They're asking Dusty Stromer to play a lot of minutes. Uh, and the freshman came up big with some rebounds, but is struggling as far as his field, uh, field goal efficiency goes. But I think Anton Watson is one of the best players in college basketball and understanding how he has to play in order for him to be successful. I mean, his game against UCLA was something else. Good enough bucket there for Mason Forbes. Lead for Utah is four. It really was. And I think Ryan Nemhart at the point guard position, really key in the transfer portal to get a player like him that has understanding as far as space goes. Foul before the shot against St. Mary's. Let me also say this, Dave. You know, it, it, we talk about the WCC. The Pac-12 only has one team in the national top 25 right now, and that's the Arizona Wildcats. And, and Tommy Lloyd's team has been awesome. They beat Michigan last week. Caleb Love is playing really well. But the Pac-12 depth-wise isn't there. USC's taken a couple losses. They lost to Irvine. Uh, they, they did not finish out the game the other day that they were playing. Um, and, and UCLA obviously has taken a couple losses early. Colorado was in the top 25. They just fell out. Pac-12 is better this year, but it's not like it's so top-heavy. Like a team like Utah can't get on a run and, and all of a sudden find itself in the mix inside the Pac-12. Uh, Kava Cato made the two free throws. Utah's in the bonus now. Almost stole the ball away. He's really playing some good minutes in the second half. Barcelona's wide open, missed the three. And now foul against St. Mary's. Those open shots are just not going down. And well, you know, just one follow-up to the point you were making about the Pac-12. To me, that's why this game tonight in these eight minutes can be so important for Utah. I mean, you win this game on the road, you're not going to have many opportunities this year, even in the Pac-12, to get what the metrics and the computers and the committee will feel like is this high quality of a road win. And, and Craig Smith knows that, talked about it with us the other day when we were on the phone with him. It's just, you know, trying to figure out what do we learn in the back-to-back -back losses? And, and how can we move forward and understand the opportunity that, that is presented right in front of us? One of two, the free throw shooting for Utah could be huge because they are in the bonus and they've extended the lead out to seven. Teaming Mahaney forced him to give the ball up. Nobody's making shots on the outside. They go inside and get the layup for Saxon. Well, what happened is Duke has gotten loose on the back cut and a defensive breakdown there forced, forced K. Bakeda to, to shift over and vacate that spot, and Saxon was wide open. Bounce pass almost went out of bounds. Utah saved it in. Dale's really good on this possession so far defensively. Madsen just a heave, and oh they call a goodness. foul. Wow. 
Jefferson got a hand in there. That's going to be three free for 52. Trying to snap out of a two game losing streak. Come up with a quad one road win against a St. Mary's team that was favored to win the West Coast Conference even above Gonzaga before the season started. But the Gales still searching for their best basketball. Well, they got time to find it, Dave. But I'll tell you what, you, you look at the West Coast Conference, we mentioned Gonzaga. Uh, San, San Francisco got a big win. Chris Gerlofson in the second season who replaced Todd Golden and went to Florida. They beat Minnesota last night. And then Santa Clara has played really good basketball this year. A couple big wins, including over Oregon last week. LMU's got an experienced team. Uh, WCC is going to be a good deep league again, even without BYU. All three free throws went down for Utah. So their lead is 60 52. And Kada saves it off of Saxon out of bounds. And what a second half this young man is playing. Uh, you know, in the stat sheet, you're going to look at it and go, well, what did he do? He's got one for one shooting. He's got four points and five rebounds. Great. But that doesn't tell you half of what he's done out on the floor. He has positioned himself brilliantly at the defensive end, grabbed a couple offensive rebounds. A 50 50 hustle play like that gives you an extra possession when you already have an eight point lead. I, he, he just looks like he's playing harder than almost everybody else out there. That time to travel and a turnover for Utah. You mentioned BYU. I saw them last week in Vegas, by the way. Yeah, they're no longer in the WCC, but Utah's going to have to play them here pretty soon. And Another that St. Mary's turnover, Sean. Go ahead. And that BYU team is, is legit. Uh, they can shoot the ball. They've got multiple shooters all over the floor. Uh, they beat a good North Carolina State team without essentially their starting center and their backup center in that game. That's going to be a really fun matchup between these two programs, but... Mark Pope's team is top 25 good, and they got ranked at number 19 this week after being unranked last week. And, of course, after this year, those two will be back to being conference mates in the Big 12. Foul against St. Mary's with 6.20 to go. Back to the free throw line for Utah, trying to extend what is their largest lead of the night. It's a conference realignment stuff. I think when you look at the Big 12, if you're a Utes fan, you got to be excited about what the future brings. And, and you and I are both Pac-12 guys. You went to Stanford, I went to UCLA. Heartbroken to see how the conference fell apart. But, but once you put, push past that, you look. And you think about what the Big 12 already has. Arizona, Arizona State, Colorado, Utah, all joining that conference. When you've already got Kansas, Baylor, Houston, TCU, Iowa State. It's really going to be a loaded conference as it has been for the better part of the last decade the best conference in the country yeah, In terms of hoops just brutal in a good way Saxon down low was fouled St. Mary's in desperate search for some offense. I mean the offense in the second half For Randy Bennett's team has been hard to watch Well, it's just so uncharacteristic Dave, I mean, like, we've been around this program for a long time, and Randy Bennett is as good as it comes with putting his guys in position to be successful. But they're one of eight from deep, five of 19 here in the second half from the field on their home floor. Yeah, just not good enough. They haven't made a shot from the field in six minutes, and they're down 10. Utah's got the ball. Batson goes right by Mahaney. Saxon helped him out. Now Wooster, floater off the glass is good. What a shot by Raleigh Wooster. And that extends out the largest lead they've had. It, just look at the stats. I mean, look, Raleigh Wooster, nine points, six rebounds. They just go and do their job. Like, when I watch Utah preparing for this game, all I thought as I watched them is they understand what their roles are. They know exactly who they are, how they have to play in order to be successful. Doesn't mean you're going to be successful every night. Doesn't mean that this is a team that's so dynamic that they're, gonna, they're the better team every time they take the floor. But they have an identity, know who they are, and, and accept who they are. And, and when you do that, you give yourself a chance. And tonight, they have done a great job at the defensive end of the floor, being disruptive to the Gales in the second half. Offensively, they have manufactured points. They've gotten to the free throw line. 
14 of the 17 free throws have come here in the second half. Yeah, meanwhile, Mitchell Saxon's missed two front ends, so even those free throws tough for the Gales. Jefferson down low, that shot no good. Rebound Utah. I kind of put you on the spot earlier in the game when I asked you why St. Mary's has struggled so much in the second half. I, I think you might be on to something. Oh, yeah, they may need to use their bench in these first halves a little more liberally because they look worn out. And they're not getting a lot of production off their bench right now either, though, Dave. Yeah, that's a dilemma. Wooster wow. hits the three. Utah's pulling away. This is, this is impressive for Craig Smith's team. Uh, you're looking at a St. Mary's team that has a, only one player score off the bench. It's Mason Forbes. Everything else has had to come from their four points a game in the second half of those contests. Tonight, they're, they're at 14. And when you struggle to score, all of a sudden now, all that effort that you're giving out at the defensive end that you're asked to give out, it just wears on you because you're always on defense. And, and the Gales, outside of getting to the free throw line, they have really struggled here in the second half. And even when they got to the free throw line, as you mentioned, Mitchell Saxon missed the front end of two one-on-ones. Yeah, just, uh, I think you've said it a couple times, everything looks difficult. Nothing looks easy. And, and, and I hate to say this, but they, they missed Logan Johnson. And maybe we devalued Logan Johnson or didn't really truly understand his value to this team. But Logan Johnson, the transfer from Cincinnati, who was outstanding, in particular last year for the Gales, uh, he, he was aggressive, and he would attack, and he would create opportunities for others. Right now, they're, they're really struggling to break the interior of this defense down of, of Utah and force them to get out of and get into rotations and create open shots for their teammates. A couple of free throws finally for the Gales, but running out of time. Just over four minutes to go, Utah. Bajima passed up the three. Down low, stolen away by the young big man off the bench, Harry Wessels. Josh Jefferson, and he scores. Good job on the drive that time. Dipped his shoulder in just enough to create space, but not enough to draw the offensive foul. And that's one of the easier shots we've seen in the second half for the Gales. Booster down low. Lovering almost lost it. Wessels called for the foul. So that takes us to a timeout. Do the Gales have one? Uh, and the Rams are off to a really good start. But when you're looking to try to build your resume for an at-large bid, should you not win the automatic bid from your conference, you got to make the most of your opportunities. That's why when we, people talk like, oh, you know, college basketball doesn't matter until you get... No, all these games matter. Ask anybody that's coaching on the sidelines right now. You need to take care of business in November and December and set the tone for what the national narrative is on your team as well as your conference. Uh, the ACC has taken some lumps here early this season, and now all of a sudden, you know, we will go into the year going, oh, is the ACC really that good? We'll find out. They got the ACC-SEC challenge. It's going to be a lot of fun and, and a lot of marquee matchups to kind of be a measuring stick of where you're at. Foul underneath the basket. Harry Wessels was fouled. I mean, the WCC has raised the bar the last few years. The expectation is this is an at-large league, that it's not just a one-big league, and it hasn't been. And St. Mary's has been a big reason why. Well, and you remember, the league is a little different this year. BYU is out of the equation. Uh, and you've got Gonzaga. You've got St. Mary's. We've mentioned... A lot of a lot of teams. I, I think Santa Clara. There's no way they're going to finish fifth. Their Herb Sennex team is playing really, really well right now. Uh, Chris Gerlofson's team, as we mentioned, got the win over Minnesota. Uh, San Diego's got a really, really young team. I'm really interested to see where Steve Lavin builds that team over the course of this season with so many fresh faces on campus. 69-57, Wooster draws a foul. Shot didn't go, but he'll go to the free throw line. It's been sort of a back and forth for both teams to the free throw line these last few minutes. Free throws aren't very exciting to commentate on, Dave. I don't know if you know that. Yeah, it's amazing the difference. We had the, the most fun first half to watch. 38-38, shots going in from everywhere, three-pointers being made. 
fast break buckets, some dunks, and it's been a, a slog since halftime. <laughs> Wooster, though, has done a lot of things right as he misses a free throw. I was trying to set him up there. Uh, but 5 of 14 shooting. Uh, he's got the six rebounds to go with the 12 points. Just you know, a really strong game from him. Not, not a game, great game as far as assists goes for him. His number's down a little bit there tonight from where it's been over the course of the season. But as far as getting them into their offense, giving them an opportunity to be successful, he's done a great job. Yeah, I think you give Utah some credit for making the game this quote ugly Wessels tried to pass out of a double team knocked out of bounds Utah's been tough. They've been physical They've locked down St. Mary's on the defensive side They are the biggest team in the country Utah Dukas curls air balls and Craig Smith, look, if you look at his resume, he's had so much success everywhere he's gone. You know, the first time I met him, do you, do you know where that was, Dave? Where was that? NAIA Mayville National Championship game. I was on the call. It used to be CSTV at the time. And I'm in the, the College of the Ozarks. And I meet this guy. He's got a lot of energy. He got his team out of basically nowhere to the national championship. And a great student body that was all fired up and, and really you look at basketball at Utah right now the women's team is Off the charts good. It has been off the charts good all last season the great run They had knocking off Stanford in the final regular season game at home and then you got Craig Smith and He's trying to get this program back to where I think that so many people expect Utah to be and that's that's in an NCAA tournament pitcher every single year and to get a program to be built back to that level, you sometimes have to be a little bit patient to allow that to happen. But I think this roster, I think this team, is starting to look that part of, like, this could be the building block now for the Craig Smith's tenure at Utah. I mean, this is a heck of a win for Utah. Final two minutes are up 13. They, they played real tough against one of the best teams in the country, Houston. Wessels with the block shot. He's done a nice job in these last few minutes. Mahaney got tied up. Wooster got his hands in there and just started to rip the ball away. St. Mary's will keep it. Aiden Mahaney had 14 in the first half. He only has three here in the second half. Wessels a nice job. You know, it, it, we mentioned the size of Utah. St. Mary's is one of the other teams in the country that has two seven-footers on their roster. Wessels is the other one. Uh, he's I, uh, to me these last few minutes are arguing for a little more playing time for him Haney knocks down the three So the lead is down to ten and now the time where this game was tight and St. Mary's was struggling to score those three rebounds led to points and that created a little bit of this gap in the separation that they've been able to maintain most of the second half I agree those are big plays for Utah they break the pressure easily get it into the front court now they want to kill time St. Mary's so far, not fouling. It'll make no sense to foul now. Yeah. Shot clock down to 10. Bajima heaved it up, shot blocked. And Abigail's need a bucket quickly. Dukas, three. Good! Lead down to seven. some point in time you got a foul here. Yeah, I, I would think after that main bucket you want to. Wooster goes all the way. He missed it, but tapped it back in. And, and I think you, it, you got to you probably want to foul earlier on that possession after the after the original make. Jefferson's three is good. Well, St. Mary's offense probably too little too late, but they've come to life. And now Utah having a hard time getting the ball in bounds. St. Mary's does get the foul more quickly this time. I mean, heck, 44.6 seconds. The lead is only six. How about this? After a sleepy, sleepy second half, all of a sudden the Gales knocked down a pair of threes. And maybe part of this, too, Dave, is that they're playing quicker. They're not thinking, right? 
And, and I know that Randy Bennett has talked about wanting this team to play a little bit faster, yet their still pace of play isn't that excessively faster from where it was a year ago. But out of necessity, they've done it, and that's a huge missed free throw. It is. Makes this one a little bit bigger for Cole Bajima, who's ordinarily a very good free throw shooter. That one no good. I tell you what, the Gales have a chance. Mahaney goes down the lane, flips it up and in off the glass with the left hand. Lead is four. Utah, wow, foul called. Howell hustled and got around and tried to knock the ball away, but they call the foul. And that'll send Wooster to the free throw line. But again, attack mode, in transition, playing a little bit faster. Don't have time to overthink the shot. And St. Mary's, in the last three possessions, they've scored on all three of them after having... A second half. I mean, they got 30 points in the second half, Dave. They scored eight on the last three possessions. Yeah. Where has this been? The Gales fans have to be thinking. So now Wooster at the line. For more big free throws. And Wooster gets the friendly roll. I think you put the ball in Mahaney's hands again. You tell him to attack. Be quick. With Dukas or Jefferson available on the outside, go ahead and swing it out there. That one perfect. So the Gales trying to extend this game. Haney picks it up. You know St. Mary's has to go very fast. This one probably has to go down. It doesn't. And a push. They're going to call a foul, I think, against Utah. Yep, that's going to send Jefferson to the free throw line. I, I don't think you want Howell in that situation. A 20% three-point shooter has spent most of the night on the bench. And, and you drive and you kick to him. But good effort on the backside of that. Jefferson, he gets pushed, and that'll send it to the free throw line. Last thing Utah wants to do. Yeah, that St. Mary's, this has been a problem. It has plagued St. Mary's in the early season. You can come up with reasons for why the offense has struggled in a lot of ways, but why why the struggles at the free throw line? From guys that historically have shot it well. Jefferson, a 73% free throw shooter. He's 0 for 2 tonight. So he makes a second. Now St. Mary sets up the pressure. Down five. Utah trying to get the ball in bounds. And now a timeout. out of timeouts full denial if you can get the turnover great if not you got a foul right away for St. Mary's Bajima will get fouled after they passed it along the baseline and that brings Bajima back down to the other end to shoot two more free throws We were ready to put this one to bed. And right away, all of a sudden, the, the Duke is three-pointer kind of ignited things. And then Jefferson hits the three. And then Mahaney's drive. And now these free throws become more impressive, more important as the officials will look to make sure that the clock is exactly what it should be. Well, obviously, the same areas. Every fraction of a second is important here. St. Mary's finished the first half on a 15 to 7 run. They're currently on a 13 to 4 run. Trying to close this one out. And I think there should be more time on the clock. Well, they started the clock before the ball had been inbounded. Yeah. That's not allowed, Dave. <laughs> that's, that's, not, that's not the way it's supposed to work. I mean, for Utah here, look, if you make your free throws, you figure you got this one. You know, St. Mary's is going to rely on Utah missing a few of these. They're going to adjust the clock. Here's Mike Reed.
so they took time off the clock. Huh. I, I, I. <laughs> what was that, Dave? I, I, I'm a little perplexed in that it looked to me like the clock started too early. Then maybe it stopped too quickly. I don't know. No, 25.8. All right. All right. Okay. Now that makes more sense. Does that make you feel better, Dave? Well, it does. You know, this is my first hoops game of the year, and I was thinking I just have totally lost my feel for how this is supposed to work. Free throw good for Bajima. How about Mitchell Saxon? Yeah. 23 free throws attempted here in the second half. 18 of the 37 points have come from the foul line. Good point. Huge part of this game for Utah. One of two. Lead is six. St. Mary's needs three, and they need it fast. Mahaney is going down the lane to kick it back out. Now down low, Wessels got fouled on the way up. That just took way too much time, and it wasn't even a three attempt. Yeah, too, too much time. And, and Dave, shooters weren't located in areas where either guard could find them. I thought Mahaney here on the drive would kick it back to Jefferson. Jefferson was the one that was open, but as he floated, he actually brought Marshall Lonis's defensive player into play and could have maybe defended both of them. All right, so free throw good. Five-point lead for Utah, 13.5 seconds. The Utes, even though they don't want to foul, they'll definitely take that sequence with all the time that ticked away. That was 10-plus seconds. Big man made them both. A good sub once again. Randy Bennett makes that sub, stops play, allows the defense to set up against the press, takes away the quick inbound. Double team and an extra pass, and now time is going to tick away. The foul, Marshallonis got the Bajima again with under 10 seconds to go. Brief moment there, St. Mary's maybe thought they had. The ball pinned in the corner. Utah did a good job of getting it out of there. They did two quick passes. Breaks the press on the throwback and then straight up the middle. This has been a hard fought game. And, and a big, big game for Utah. That is a great. I said it a few minutes ago. I said it's a great win. I'm pretty confident now it's going to be a great win, although game's not over. Mahaney got to shoot the ball. Jefferson, three, no good. Rebound and a foul under the basket. Are they calling an intentional gonna... foul? Uh, yeah, against Wessels, I think. And Mike Reed called an intentional foul against Harry Wessels. So that that essentially is going to end the game. Well, an intentional foul. I don't know. It was a hard foul. Kind of looked like Trent Williams on a pulling tackle situation for the 49ers to create a gap for Christian McCaffrey. Dave, that's I that's mean, seven feet tall and roughly what 260 270 yeah a big dude so and i understand as an official you don't want a dirty play in the game dave i saw multiple fights this weekend i had a game where four player four players and a co uh, three players and a coach were ejected in las vegas i'm all for keeping it clean these days everybody is yeah. just, just calm down we're okay yeah, it's an interesting point you make because yeah, I, uh, officials watch games. They talk to one another. I mean, it could be that there's a, a sentiment of let's cool some of this stuff down a little bit after what happened over the weekend. Yeah, they dr drop the temperature down. So they're not upgrading anything here. Okay. Uh, but they are keeping it as is. So Brandon Carlson will be at the free throw line. 
He'll get the two. Utah will get the ball. Brandon Carlson, amazing. This is going to be the fewest points in the Craig Smith era for Brandon Carlson in a Utah win. And maybe that's the good news for the Utes is that it's Carlson had one of his worst games and they're going to come up with a great win. Well, David is. And, and that's where you look at roster construction, right? And, and Craig Smith, a couple of years ago when he took this job, this wasn't a team that when they got off the bus looked like they were a Pac-12 team. They look like they're a Pac-12 team right now. And they've gone on the road here tonight. And you saw three guys, these three, step up uh, and, and play a pivotal role in what is going to be a signature victory early this season. I mean, this is a great win, especially coming great off with win. two losses. You lose great to win. Houston, you lose to St. John's, you're winning at St. Mary's. Quad one victory for Craig Smith and the Utes. Yeah, Utah should be proud of that one, and Sean St. Mary's has.